Good morning. Thank you for coming. My name is Emma Kidwell. I'll be moderating the session uh, on behalf of Celia. Uh, if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat box next to the uh, session video where I'll field them to Celia pending if we have time for questions. Uh, Celia, I'm going to hand it off to you. Thank you, Emma. Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here at GDC Summer. And I hope that everybody is doing well, as well as your uh, loved ones. So my name is Sylvia Hudent, and I have a PhD in psychology. And I've been working in the video game industry uh, over uh, 12 years now. I've worked at Ubisoft, I worked at LucasArts, and I worked at Epic Games. I was director of UX at Epic uh, at the studio level. And I worked uh, on Unreal Engine, I worked on a bunch of games, and I worked very closely with uh, Fortnite team. I left Epic in October 2017. Ever since then, I, I'm a independent consultant. And so I uh, help a lot of companies, like AAA companies, smaller companies, uh, to um, develop their UX mindsets and to develop processes and, and train people and all that. So this approach of emotion is going to be through the lens of UX. My framework for UX is to um, break it down into two big pillars. So uh, you have usability and engageability. When you try to uh, um, anticipate problems from happening in your game and you try to uh, you know, uh, improve things, there are two big lenses. Um, usability is the ability of the game to be used. So it's more about the functionality. Are people uh, understanding what to do? Uh, can they accomplish the objectives they need to accomplish? Like if they need to craft in your game, can they understand how to craft? So that's the usability part. And uh, a game can be usable, but boring. It's not because a game is gonna be uh, easy to understand and easy to use that it's gonna make it engaging. So we also need to look into engageability, especially, especially for video games, because the whole point of interacting with a, a system and when you play a game is to uh, uh, have fun and be engaged and to interact with the system. So engageability is um, more around stuff like uh, motivation, emotion, and game flow. So this is a, a framework that I've been using to tackle problems like uh, UX issues so that we can understand where they come from and that we can um, uh, fix them. I, I did a bunch of uh, GDC presentations on the topic. Uh, they are called the gamer's brain and part one, part two, part three. So you can just uh, go back and, and see that if you're interested and you haven't seen it um, uh, before. But here, we're going to tackle emotion in this, um, of, in this framework. And uh, again, through the lens of UX and, and, and by understanding what's the science behind it and how we can use it to improve the user experience of, of a game. So there's gonna be three big parts in this uh, presentation. We're gonna start with the science of emotion. I'm not gonna go super deep, uh, of course, but it's not, it's just for you to have a, a broad understanding of, of uh, you know, what's, the, uh, what's going on in the brain when we have emotions. And then we're gonna talk about um, the UX framework to use emotion in, in game design. And lastly, we're gonna to touch um, on ethics considerations. Of course, there's a lot of, of, of stuff to say around uh, emotion. In 45, 40, 45 minutes, I really don't have the time to uh, talk about many things. So the idea is, is just to um, give you like an overview and during the questions, I can also uh, dive deeper into um, some elements. So the uh, limbic system is what is thought uh, to be responsible for emotion in, in, uh, in uh, the human brain. Uh, there is a, a broad consensus ar around it in science, but it's not completely clear. There are some uh, scientists that actually don't agree that there is a, such a thing as the limbic system. Uh, but for the sake of simplicity here, let's say that there is some sort of consensus ar around this. And so the limbic system, it's um, um, a lot of, of, of uh, uh, parts in the brain that take part in, um, that are in, in in this system, you can see here just a few of them. And these ones are very deep down the brain. So um, the uh, thalamus, uh, hypothalamus, hippocampus, and amygdala. The frontal lobe is, is um, more uh, um, the, uh, on the, the cortex uh, area. 
And um, the hippocampus is an interesting part of the brain because we know that it's also taking part into memory, into souvenirs. And the amygdala is uh, oftentimes the, uh, the uh, part of the brain that we mention when we talk about uh, emotion and, and, and uh, fight or flight uh, responses. So it's just to, for you to have like a, a big um, um, overview of what we, what we call the limbic system. And so usually when we talk about emotion is to say that it's guiding our behavior. We need to survive in this world. And so we seek pleasure and we avoid pain. This is uh, how we can uh, find food and, uh, and mate and, and uh, <laughs> carry on with our genes and avoid uh, getting killed, getting hurt. So overall emotion is very good for that. If we try something, it's pleasurable. We're going to remember that. We're going to do it again. Uh, so we do need to remember that. And that's uh, typically like the amygdala uh, and the hippocampus is uh, helping us uh, do that. And of course, if we're experiencing something and it's, and it's having a, a bad outcome, this is where um, we remember not to do this again. So it's really important to have these emotions so it can uh, guide us through um, our lives. Oops, sorry. Um, so we learn to recognize and avoid unpleasant situations. So here's an example. Uh, if you've been, if you've experienced uh, being uh, um, bitten by a, a dog, you will remember that. And we learn some, uh, some elements. There are some, there's a, a very uh, uh, um, natural, I would say, but some that we learn and we can reduce that in video games. And, and of course, uh, artists uh, do that very well. For example, if you see an uh, enemy that has very sharp teeth, like uh, here in, um, in Mario, you don't need to really experience uh, what's gonna happen when you get close to it. You understand that this is an enemy, that it is dangerous uh, and that you should avoid it. Otherwise you are gonna probably get hurt. So through emotions, that sort of emotions, we can guide our players to understand what's, uh, what's um, uh, a good outcome and what's probably dangerous. So that's pretty basic, um, but a lot of people misunderstand conditioning a little bit. There's a lot of um, um, uh, conditioning has a bad name today. And uh, sure enough, when we think about conditioning, we think about the Skinner box and we think about the experiments that um, he did with um, mostly with rats and with pigeons. And they had to, um, to tap or to uh, uh, press on a pedal, for example, when there was a light uh, lining up to get food, but they also need to learn to, to press a pedal or to not press the, a certain pedal to avoid getting electrical shocks. So this is what conditioning is about. You learn to, um, this is more specifically operant conditioning. So you see a, a stimulus, you need to uh, do a, a certain action. So press the pedal, for example, in order to either get a, a, a reward or to avoid a punishment. This is something that uh, we use um, uh, in our lives all the time. Um, if you think about um, uh, shaking hands, for example, we've been conditioned to uh, every time you see someone like uh, doing this gesture, like uh, raising out to uh, reach out to your hand, we have been conditioned to do the same uh, because this is a uh, social construct and we need to do that. Today, we can't do this anymore. And so we have to repress that, that movement. Uh, now, now today we, we got used to it, but for a moment it was hard to, uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, it was really hard to repress ourselves to shake hands. And uh, that happened to me uh, very often. And um, that's because we've been conditioned um, to do that. And so in that case, we need to relearn uh, because uh, we have like, for example, people, if, if uh, I, I try to reach out to you, Han, and I, and I see that you're looking at me like, no, I mean, we need to be careful. This is a, uh, can be um, interpreted as a negative outcome and because of social um, relatedness and, and, and uh, social elements are really important for humans, we're gonna react, uh, we're gonna change our, uh, our um, um, pattern to react to this, to have a better, uh, more adapted response. So this is what conditioning is about. It's about uh, learning to repeat uh, certain actions uh, that lead to pleasurable outcomes and to avoid certain actions that lead to um, non-pleasurable uh, outcomes or dangerous ones. 
I'm going to make you listen to um, this sound effect. Um, so be careful. I, it should not be too loud, but I'm just like, if, if you have uh, headphones, just be careful. Uh, this is a sound coming up. So listen to the sound. So I didn't hear anything. I don't, I don't know <laughs> if you uh, heard the sound in there. Uh, I hope you did. I did not have feedback on that. Um, so this was the sound from Metal Gear Solid. So if people have played Metal Gear Solid, this is a sound that is very recognizable and that you've been conditioned to react to whenever you hear it, uh, because you know that it's the sound that we hear whenever there are enemies around that are about to spot you. So uh, you've been uh, conditioned to either hide very quickly or go into the open and, and shoot at everybody. So this is an example of conditioning that is pretty powerful in a video game uh, because it can guide us. And it's also creating some, uh, some emotional response. Of course, it's raising your awareness because we know that there is danger around because this uh, particular um, stimulus has been uh, uh, tied to danger. So that's an example of how we, uh, we can use emotions uh, in games and use conditioning uh, and not in a way that is uh, going to be uh, uh, tricky. We're going to talk about dark patterns and, and, uh, uh, and emotions um, that trigger uh, uh, not so good, uh, um, that create some manipulation is not so good. But uh, conditioning is very important in our lives, and this is uh, a very efficient way to learn. Uh, for example, another example of uh, real life is you've been conditioned if you start driving and you forgot to fasten your seatbelt, then your car is going to beep, and we react to that beep because it's super annoying by fastening up um, our seatbelt. This is the uh, response that we've been conditioned to do so that the, the annoying beeping stops. So emotion guides our cognition and this idea that we need to be emotionless uh, to uh, reason appropriately is not um, true. You have the same neural networks that, um, take, uh, that take part into emotion, also take part into reasoning. And so cognition and uh, uh, emotion work together. We need emotions to uh, be able to, uh, to have a, a, an adaptive response uh, to our world. Music is a very particular in, uh, um, in uh, our brain because we have a very special response to uh, music for um, some reason. So it, uh, it's one of the most rewarding and pleasurable uh, experience uh, for humans. And it, it's um, modulating, it can modulate activity in a very, um, um, in the regions that are associated to primary brain forces, uh, such as uh, food or sex. So it's, it's particularly powerful. And that's the reason why we can have goosebumps uh, or we can cry when we listen to, to a certain music is it is particularly powerful in humans. And so, of course, we should uh, use that in video games uh, when uh, you have games. And I, can, I know that on, the, on mobile, a lot of people um, turn the sound off. So it's, uh, of course, creating some constraints. But uh, in the, uh, other games, it's really important to polish the sound design and the music, uh, but without forgetting about accessibility and uh, players uh, who have uh, hearing impairments uh, who are deaf, so that they are also taken into account. So emotion guides our behavior, but what's interesting, it's, um, it's also influenced by our cognition. So we, we saw that emotion is, is, is uh, making us do stuff that we're gonna interpret later on. So emotion guides our cognition, uh, but also our cognition is influencing our uh, emotion. Then I'm gonna take an example, uh, I'm French, so <laughs> take an example uh, with a bottle of uh, champagne and find bottle of champagne. If you have two bottles of champagne, like one is, uh, this one is Dom Perignon, so if you uh, know about champagne, you know it's a very expensive uh, uh, brand of champagne and uh, the bottle looks really, really nice, it's really appealing. And let's say you have another uh, bottle of champagne, it's like a blast plastic bottle and it, it looks super cheap. And uh, we ask you to try 
the champagne from both of these bottles, uh, most people are going to have a tendency to think that, uh, to feel that the champagne coming from a nice, uh, the very fine bottle um, tastes better than the one from the plastic bottle. But uh, of course, it's the same champagne. And so this is how our cognition, our expectations um, is changing actually how we feel about things. This is what we call appraisal. Easel. We uh, judge of situations based on what we know, based on our culture, based on uh, social construct. And so this is in impacting uh, our conscious feeling um, of, of things. So that's appraisal. And uh, that's uh, really important to, to understand because uh, uh, we know that our perception is subjective. It's, it's, uh, it can be cultural based. And so this is going to have a, an impact on how we feel about uh, things, about art. Um, and so we need to take in, that into account. So that's appraisal. You also have a reappraisal. So reappraisal is when you have some bad emotion, like some, some um, negative emotion happening. Let's say you just uh, lost a game. Um, and reappraisal is when you try to um, uh, get over it. And it could, it could be seen as uh, seeing the, the glass half full instead of half empty. Now here's an example in, um, in a multiplayer game, Overwatch, um, so an old screenshot, uh, where they do that pretty well. So in any multiplayer game uh, that is competitive, you're always going to have some players that are going to have some negative emotions because they lost. And so it's going to be important to help them reappraise uh, the situation. And so here's the, the screen that uh, you would see when you were on the, um, on the uh, victorious team. So for those who don't know, Overwatch is a game you play six versus six. Um, and, and this is what you would see when you win. So you have uh, um, badges and your, your XP is going up and it's, it's, all, it's all great. When you're on the um, defeated team, you actually, so you have the feedback that you lost, but they don't insist on uh, how crappy you are to uh, have lost. It's not like, oh, you, you suck, you, you lost. They tell you that uh, you are defeated. But they try to help you reappraise the situation by showing you how you got better uh, against your own stats. So they don't emphasize how you compare to other players because uh, it's very likely that we're not on top of the chart. Um, in the six versus game, there's uh, one player that's on top of the, uh, the uh, scoreboard and the, all, all others are not. Um, but if you compare people to their own stats, it is very likely that we're going to get better uh, because we played more. And so we, uh, as we uh, practice the game, we are very likely to progress. And that's a, that is a very good feeling. Uh, so one of the elements that I showed you from the framework that I'm using in motivation is intrinsic motivation. One part of this is um, uh, competence. We need to feel competent in an activity to um, be motivated to keep playing that, to keep doing that activity. And so in a game um, where there's a lot of competence going on, it's really important to see ourselves progressing. So if it's a skill-based game um, and we practice, we are likely to get better. And so if you um, emphasize how the player is getting better against their own stats, it's, uh, it's helping them reappraise the fact that they lost. So this is an example of how, by understanding a little bit better how emotion is is working, you can uh, you can help um, uh, creating uh, uh, designing for some experiences that are going to be more pleasurable uh, emotionally for players. So that's the 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 to sum up this part: emotion guides our behavior and cognition, and cognition in return influences our emotion. So now we're going to talk about emotion in game design. And to talk about this, we're going to start by talking uh, about emotion in, in design. So Don Norman is a, a UX designer and a kind of scientist, and he's the one who coined the term UX back in the 90s. So he's, he's like the father of, of uh, the UX mindset. And he has a book called Emotional Design, where he explains a little bit the three levels of processing. When we interact with an object or a system, we're going to um, process uh, this, this, this system through 
three levels uh, that are uh, gonna uh, create some emotions. So the first one is visceral. That's the level that is very uh, uh, based on appearance. It's it's like your gut feeling, uh, like the the term is is pretty self-explanatory. It's visceral, so it's how things look, um, uh, bright colors, for example, or how things taste, uh, the look, feel, the sounds. Um, this is really like you just look at something and it looks amazing. Uh, if you're into cars, you know, they're the cars that, that, that like look, uh, uh, have like lines that are uh, either aggressive or they, you really feel that uh, they're, they're powerful. This is all about visceral um, design. And so that's really important in games as well, uh, of course. And it's uh, uh, all about presentation, art, um, direction, but also uh, game feel. We're going to talk about game feel a bit um, in the next slide. And so this is the first level of processing. The next level is behavioral. So it's how do we interact with that system? Uh, so it's the pleasure and effectiveness of use. So this time it's, it's, it's less about how it looks, you know, how beautiful it is. It's not about the aesthetic, it's about the functionality. It's about, am I able to accomplish the things that I want to accomplish? And so uh, in UX, we call that usability. Um, we make sure that a, uh, a system like a video game is gonna be designed to, uh, to be used by a human. So this is what we call human-centered design. And uh, we make sure that it's usable so that we understand signs and feedback, that we understand how to uh, use the, the system. We have form follows function, function comes first, and we try to make sure that uh, the functionality is conveyed through uh, the, the shape and, and sound of um, the element. All of these things is uh, about behavioral uh, level, and of course, accessibility is um, in there. And the last uh, level is reflective. So this is more about the self-image uh, that we get when we interact with, uh, with the system. Maybe we felt guilt or maybe uh, we felt pr uh, uh, we are proud because we won. So that's self-image, uh, personal satisfaction, memories. Um, so it's all about the meaning of, of elements, you know, what it, what it makes you uh, uh, think about. You know, it's, uh, uh, if you think about uh, um, Star Wars, if, if uh, you're uh, in your 30s or 40s, you know, you have like that, that uh, memories are, that are attached to it. And it's, it's more about, you know, the battle of, of the good against evil, uh, more than a political um, movie. So it's all about uh, the, the story, the narrative, um, the meaning, what does it mean uh, to you? So uh, it's, it's not now, not about the functionality, but it's about how you reflect um, on this. Novelty is also a part of it. You know, you we like to have uh, novel ex experiences, and uh, so we can uh, reflect on these uh, elements. So this is the the, the baseline, um, the the three levels of process when we interact with anything. So these all happen at the same time, and this uh, very was very well described by Don Norman. Here I'm gonna show you how we use in game design emotion uh, more specifically. So there are two big notions in, in game design um, to tackle emotion. The first one is what we call game feel. So there's a book by Steve Swink that is very uh, uh, that describes very well what game feel is about. Um, but basically, it's how good it feels to interact with the game. So there are three very important notions in here. The first one is what we call the three C's. Um, and I'm going to describe that a bit uh, later. Uh, so it's a camera control character. Uh, it's also about the sense of presence. Do I feel, uh, is there anything preventing me from feeling that I am inside um, the game? And the last one is the sense of physical reality. Is it, is it believable when I don't know if there's a game there and you explode balloons? Do you have like a, a believable uh, a physical uh, experience in there? You know, balloons popping, you know, like a, uh, with a specific, a specific sound effect, uh, VFX, et cetera. So to be more precise, uh, the three Cs, like I said, it's as camera control characters. Um, so camera is, is going to have a very big impact on how we feel about the game, of course. Um, so if you have a game that is godlike, <clears throat> most, most of the time you're going to have a top-down or isometric view of, uh, of the game because you feel that you can control things and uh, you're, you're like managing all this world. 
if you want a game that that more about the the thrill about being scared which is the visceral level like being scared about something like a roller coaster uh, or horror movies is the visceral level um <clears throat> and to accomplish that we uh we gonna use a first person camera and sometimes most of the time we're gonna have a narrow field of view so it feels like you don't you don't see around and it's it's, it's much easier to jump scare people when we do that so the choice of camera is going to have a big impact on how the game feels uh, and it's of course very important it's one of the main elements that uh, we need to, to to tackle in a game another very critical element is uh, are the controls um, you know how how the, the players are going to be able to uh, uh, interact with the system and what are the controls? Uh, is it going to be easy to, to do or do you have like, like to, to feel like an octopus to, uh, to accomplish some uh, very uh, common actions in the game? Um, I'm showing here the controls from ESK because it, it was a very interesting use of um, control. So ESK is the game about skating. And um, in, instead of using the, the face buttons for uh, uh, the tricks, they used the, the thumbstick um, to, uh, the, the idea was to try to recreate with your thumb the this sort of physical feeling that you would get while skating. Uh, and so that was an interesting uh, uh, approach to, um, to control. So the controls and how could they feel, uh, if they feel natural or uh, is it, is it uh, uh, kind of weird? It's, it's, not a, uh, it's not by chance that we have, um, uh, that we shoot on, on um, a uh, 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 console game with the triggers because it feels like a, a trigger from, um, a real gun, so and and it's and, and you hold it, and it's uh, you have a good grip um, in your hand. So controls are also very important to nail in your game. And the last one is uh, character. So the main character is the avatar of the the player, of course, but all the characters in the game are going to be important, and uh, they need to convey some uh, some emotions. So of course we care a lot about who are these characters, what do they transcend, and uh, so here's an example from. Um, um, Hellblade, and you have Sinua. She's uh, so she's the avatar. She's she's the, the heroine of the, of the of the game. And you see, like for example, there's a element from this um, um, character model, as she has that rot that is growing on her hand every time she dies, um, and well, every time the player dies, and and she uh, ex experimented in, in her world, and so you see that thing growing on her arm. So on her on her arm. So all these elements are really, really important to uh, have a good game feel. And uh, many big studios, they are tackling, you know, camera controls characters first uh, during their pre-production um, so that they can nail that uh, the best they can. So that was for the three Cs. And then I told you about presence and physical reality. So presence is, uh, do I feel present in the game? And by by that, I don't mean removing the HUD. Um, it's not by removing all the things that you necessarily gonna have a, a bigger sense of presence. Like imagine um, uh, if you drive a new car that you don't know, uh, it's not about removing uh, the all the, the controls and, and, and all the, the dashboard that's gonna make you feel that you're on the road is uh, when these controls and dashboard are not in the way and it feels natural and you can just concentrate on the road. It's the same thing with the video game. You have the controls and you have the interface and yeah, you have um, the, the HUD. Um, but if when it's not in the way, this is when you can feel that you have presence um, in the game. So of course, usability is uh, really important to, uh, to nail that. Presence is also, um, do I feel that I'm part of the world? So um, uh, if you look at a game where you have a, a crowd AI, is the crowd reacting in a... a a, uh, a realistic way to what you're doing. So for example, in Assassin's Creed, if you're doing like, something weird or you're assassinating someone in the street and, and people see you, if the crowd is, is, is reacting to that, it makes you feel present in the game. Um, in um, 2D, for example, in a mobile game like Clash of Clans, you want to build a new building and you feel that sense of presence because as you say, yeah, I want to build that, you have the little characters that come over and they start building. And so it makes you feel that you have a real presence into the world and the, the, the game world is reacting to you. 
the narrative also, also is really important for, for presence. Uh, the story, you know, can I I'll make choices that are gonna be meaningful for the story? All that increases the same of presence um, and music and, and all that. Uh, I can't cover it all, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like pretty, uh, pretty important. And physical reality is, is it, does it, is it believable? So I, I told you, like, if you pop balloons in a game, do, do you feel that it is, it is balloon? Is it doing like the pop sound that you would expect from balloons? Um, do you have particle effects? Uh, if you have a very strong character that is running towards you, um, you might have like a camera shake every time the character, like as it runs, um, uh, hit, you know, the foot hits the ground. So all these elements are about physical reality. It is not about photorealism. Again, it's more about is it believable um, in the game? So here I'm going to show you an example from Fortnite. Uh, again, so it's old it's from the, the closed alpha around the loot box. Uh, why I'm showing you that because uh, it's, it's particularly the game feel uh, on this is particularly well uh, well done. And um, you can see that the loot box is not just a box. It's not just a chest or a card pack that you would um, open. It is in the shape of a llama piñata. So that's all about presence. You know, it, it's also about the narrative. You know, how does it fit uh, the world? It's also reacting uh, to you when you move the mouse around its eyes, it's, uh, they are following you. And when you're about to hit it, uh, so you have like a, uh, it feels, um, you have that sense of physical reality and then you have um, um, particle effects and all that. So I'm gonna show you how it looks like. Um, hopefully you'll have the sound. It's a lovely day for loot. Have at it. Ooh. Oh, I am feeling lucky. Hey, check out this nice loot. All right, so you see, you know, there's stuff happening and, oh, you get something cool, you know, it's changed in color and you have all this, all this stuff happening. So all of that is about game feel and it's really important to, uh, to polish it and the game to increase the emotional connection that we have to it. Okay, so that was about game feel and uh, arguably you know, we can talk about hours about that, but I just wanna move on so that you have a, a, an overview about all the things that you can talk about. Um, there's also, like, the brain is, is pretty uh, uh, reactive to novelty um, because anything new in our environment can potentially kill us. Uh, so we have a tendency to, to, to pay attention, to raise our awareness when something is new uh, and that can be potentially dangerous. So that's the reason why we love novelty. Uh, we love to have sur surprises and, and to discover things. Uh, this is why learning is pleasurable uh, most of the time. And uh, we can use that to uh, sustain engagement so that players are not getting bored. If you always do the same activity, even though you like that activity, at some point, you know, you, your awareness is, is, uh, is uh, decreasing because, you know, you don't really need to pay attention. So that's the reason why um, uh, novelty, so discovery, surprises, curiosity, all things that we can use to raise engagement uh, and, and awareness. So an example, uh, some examples of that um, in Zelda, you had like they use they tease players a lot. You have they they tease players' curiosity. So in this uh, old uh, screenshot from uh, uh, Link to the Past, you have, you see the cracks in the wall, and these are new cracks uh, from this wall. It's, it's a different wall that that you've never seen before, and so players see that for the first time. Like, how oh, that's that seems new, and and how how do I uh, interact with that? And this is how you learn that you need a super bomb to uh, explode this, uh, this particular wall. So through uh, something a bit new, uh, it cannot be too new because then it can be very scary to have something look so completely new, but we like to, to have some novelty and to have our curiosity um, teased. Another example of uh, that is uh, Uncharted 3. In Uncharted 3, you have a, a section in the game where you're in a ship and the ship is sinking. As, as it sinks, it's, it's um, a rotating, uh, it's tilting at 90 degrees and all your controls are rotated 90 degrees as a result. So it, it's creating some sort of some new surprise and that's tied to game feel, so it's tied to controls. And so, for example, if you, if you tr try to move forward, your character is actually uh, moving left. 
and that creates some some sort of uh, of novelty. So it's 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 good to do that once the player is already used uh, to, uh, to the controls. So that it brings some sort of of novelty that is raising your awareness. Um, another game does that. Limbo um, does that. You have a level where um, so it's a it's, it's a uh, uh, like you side scrolling. Um, um, platforming uh, puzzle game and uh, at some point you have a level where your um, the gravity is, uh, is upside down so when you arrive in this level all of a sudden like you you uh, you get stuck to the ceiling so all these elements are something new that's happening in the game at some point when you're already used to the game so that's is raising awareness um, another example more tied to to narrative um, is on uh, fortnite or on Diablo you have this the mimics so you you think it's a uh, chest and you you know you don't even pay attention you you just like hold to open it and surprise this is not a chest it is an enemy that's trying to uh, destroy you so all these things is bring some uh, novelty. Uh, the problem with that is uh, you need to uh, to make it novel uh, quite often uh, to to work, and that's the reason why we have a we need to uh, always have new new elements in a, in an online game um, that is uh, that is live, so that players are not getting bored. Um, so one of the ways to do that is to create, have new content, so DLC or, or new seasons or new characters or new maps. Um, multiplayer games can be more engaging in the long term uh, because every time you play, it can be with different players, so it can bring something new or systemic, uh, procedurally generated games um, are uh, can help with that because every time you play, it's going to be a little bit different. Arguably, it's, it's it's taking a lot of time, and it's also making uh, the uh, game uh, uh, workers crunch quite a bit. So it, it, it does have its downside for sure. Just here a few books if you want to dive more into the the topics. So emotional design from Don Norman, game feel from Steve Swink, and uh, how games move us from Kat, uh, Catherine Isvister. And, and again, think about emotion. Um, so in my framework, I explained that emotion is here to uh, support uh, motivation. And, you, and this is what you really need uh, to do uh, to uh, think about game feel and presence and surprises and how this can support player motivation in terms of competence, um, uh, autonomy, and relatedness. So, for example, if you have particle effects, it's even more meaningful if it's because you just won something or you accomplished a goal and so you feel competent. So the last, um, so yeah, this is it for this part. So uh, remember to use game field, three C's, presence, physical reality, and novelty uh, to sustain engagement. And the last part, I'm gonna go fast because I'm already, uh, um, it's really late already. <laughs> so it's all about trying to manipulate emotions ethically. Um, there is no such thing as new, uh, neutral design. Anything that we design is gonna influence people to interact with it in a certain way. Um, for example, if you have a handle on a, on a um, door this is influencing you to grab the handle and and pull uh, so sometimes these doors needs to be pushed and that's a bit annoying so it manipulated you into a, a wrong uh behavioral response so it's not the end of the world uh, but everything that we create everything that we design is going to have an impact on people's expectations and behavior and art of course is about manipulating emotion so we need to understand that nothing we do is going to be neutral and we need to ensure that this is not going to have a negative impact on our players um of course so i told you that we need emotion to uh, uh to think rational to um accomplish our, our goals and to uh um to be able to reason the problem is and emotions can trick us of course um so here are just a few examples that have been studied by behavioral economics you have the example of scarcity when something uh is uh, getting scarce like we we had that a few countries at that where um because of the pandemic all of a sudden there uh where a scarcity in uh, toilet paper and so when there's scarcity even though you you know you didn't 
care that much about toilet paper. Now we want it uh, because uh, we might not have it. And so scarcity works a lot with the fear of missing out, the FOMO, um, because we know that maybe maybe it's going to be gone before I get there. Uh, so anytime you see sales, um, this is the, um, uh, the the fear of missing out is used. Like, you know, it's ending tonight or so. Like, oh, you have to be there. You have only like one more day to benefit all of these uh, awesome discounts. Thus, aversion, we are very averse to loss more than uh, we like gains. And so anytime we feel that players are going to lose something, uh, we play on loss aversion. So an example would be streaks when like in Snapchat, you had the snap streak um, and like every day you interact with a certain person, you uh, it's going up and up and up. And if one day you don't interact with that person, it's going all the way back down. And this plays on loss aversion. So we don't want to lose all that awesome streak. And so that's encouraging us to keep interacting with the system even though we didn't really want to do it that day. And the last one of my examples, there's many, many more. It's the anchoring effect. Uh, we also see that in, uh, in sales. And like when you see the, the original price and you have the straight through on it and you see the, the new price, the discounted price, um, we have a tendency to uh, base our decision uh, on, on um, on uh, an anchor, on uh, we compare things, and this can uh, um, persuade us to buy something that we did not really want. Um, so this is all the things when emotion trick us and has been used in tech and in marketing and and and, and many uh, situations for um, as for a long, 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 long time. Um, the thing is, uh, we have to be careful uh, and see how it can impact negatively our, our players. When we do UX, we think about humans first and not the business first. Of course, we need to make sure that the, the game is going to be sustainable, um, but we don't want to trick players because uh, this is not what we do. Here is an example of a, uh, one of these emotional uh, uh, trick that sometimes uh, people use. I'm going to use the example of Amazon because uh, they're uh, they're pretty famous, infamous for that. Um, so, for example, like here, they uh, use the loss aversion, like oh, you don't want to subscribe for Amazon Prime, and therefore you're ready to. Well, they don't use the term lose, which is uh, making it a bit better. Uh, but so, oh yeah, you agree to not to not um, save uh, some money, and so it's also. Uh, implying that you're a bit dumb, uh, so it's playing on your on your emotion. So of course, uh, we're gonna have that in video games because again, uh, an art form is going to manipulate emotion by definition, but we need to be careful at what is it we're manipulating. And if we're using some um, some some of these uh, emotional tricks not to um, to serve gameplay or not to uh, increase the, the experience for the players, but to increase our uh, uh, business goals or to make players come back or to make them uh, spend more. So I'm not saying that it's an easy way to define where's the line, uh, like the crops dying or the Tamagotchi, it's difficult to, to uh, have that experience of that, that these sort of games without um, that that loss version of feeling um, um, because things are decaying if you're not here. So I'm not saying that it's very easy to define where uh, the line is, but we certainly need to um, to think about it that way so we can uh, understand what impact we have on our players especially when we are uh, targeting kids or we know that um, our game is played by uh, kids because kids uh, don't have a mature prefrontal cortex. So I don't know if you remember the, the one of the first slides, I showed you the limbic system and it's interacting with the uh, frontal lobe and more specifically the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain that is uh, 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 avoiding automatic um, behavior. And sometimes this is when we stop and think uh, instead of falling for the trap or falling you know, for a loss of version, we're gonna stop and think and that's thanks to the prefrontal cortex. The problem is uh, the limbic system develops way faster than the prefrontal cortex and uh, the prefrontal cortex is maturing around um, completely around 23 to 25 years old. So it's not to say that uh, teenagers are completely uh, lost before that, um, but it is harder for um, young children and even teenagers to resist uh, some of these tricks. So we definitely need to be careful um, more so than we are when we're addressing adults. So I'm gonna leave you with that. You know, um, if you have a game that is rated T or E, uh, make sure to avoid uh, all these tricks and reconsider 
uh, them in all, all the games. So guilt tripping, uh, loss of version, fear of missing out, uh, loot box tied to monetization because it's using conditioning, et cetera, et cetera. So manipulate emotions ethically. Um, emotions are gonna be manipulated in an art form. It is normal and it's good, it's, we, we want that, but we need to consider the ethics of the manipulation in our art form. So this is the reason why you can take a look at ethicalgames.org, which is a, a initiative that we just kicked off. And uh, we have a panel at GDC Summer on uh, Thursday at uh, 10 a.m. if you're interested in that topic. All right, I talk too much, so I'm just right uh, on time, but I don't think we're gonna have enough time for questions. Uh, but you, have, you see here the books that I uh, wrote and you can poke me on Twitter and you'll find some resources on my blog. And let me know, Emma, if you, we have time for maybe one or two questions or if uh, I should take it offline and, and answer questions on Twitter or on chat. <laughs>